have reached the half century mark. I said that last week, but now it's official. It's episode 50 of Hitting for the Cycle, so it's a milestone episode for us, and we are in the final stretch of the uh, regular season, second to last week of the Major League Baseball season. Joined by Ben Cruz, I'm Ryan Tui, and Ben, how are you doing this morning? Doing good. Uh, it's a Friday. Um, the sun is shining. Uh, there's a little coolness out into the year, uh, which kind of remembers that it is now the end of baseball season. Ryan, we had one hell of a year um, talking baseball. And uh, the crazy part is that this is not the end. This is only just the beginning because we saw the postseason, which is the uh, most important time of the year. I'm not sure about my respective team being in it once again, but that's not a start for another day. Um, but all in all, uh, really good stuff. Um, doing well. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. Can't necessarily complain. My team has clinched a playoff spot this year um, after missing the playoffs last year. So I'm in a much better mood at this time this year than I was last year. Um, so all I can say is um, I can't complain too much um, when it comes to baseball, that is. And uh, I'm looking forward to the playoffs, obviously. And like I said, we still have another week of the regular season to go. And uh, we're, we're in the home stretch now. And it's crazy. We've basically done a show every week throughout this entire baseball season and uh, we're hoping to obviously keep going throughout the uh throughout the playoffs so we have a lot to get into for this episode and before we do we want to remind everybody to please follow hitting for the cycle on facebook x and instagram at hftcetb follow the empty the bench podcast network at etb network Follow our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash ETB Network. You see it right here below. And finally, listen to us on whatever platforms you listen to your podcasts on. And this episode, as always, guys, is presented by Playback. Watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much of our time watching alone. Playback is a virtual space where communities can uh, stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play -play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive and a social experience. From playing fantasy sports, repping your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETB Network to find out more, including our live stream schedule. Um, we're still obviously uh, playback is something we're continuously going throughout, um, you know, with a lot of stuff coming up. So, uh, you know, keep posted for that. All right. So we're going to get into it and we're going to start um, with probably the biggest elephant in the room right now in Major League Baseball. Shohei Otani officially has made history. He has officially created the 50-50 club in Major League Baseball, becoming the first Major League Baseball player ever to hit 50 home runs and steal 50 bases in a single season. And he did it in style um, in a Dodgers blowout win over the Marlins on Thursday afternoon in Miami. Otani went six for six. Yes, six for six with two home runs, two doubles, and uh, 10 runs batted in. 17 total bases on the day for uh, Otani. Just absolutely absurd numbers uh, when you see that gra when you see that graphic. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, Otani was just on fire yesterday. It was amazing. Um, he stole his 50th base um, in the first inning of the game. Um, then he hit his 49th home run in the sixth inning. Um, then he hit his 50th home run in the seventh inning. And um, oh yeah. I said, did I say um, two home runs? You said runs? two. I it's reached up that other figure. Three, this graphic is wrong. It's three home runs. Even more. Even more crazy. No, I, no we, we were um, underestimating the power of Otani. Three home runs, <laughs> two stolen bases. I mean, honest to God. <laughs> you got to take the graphic off. There we go. Three home <laughs> runs. Three home runs for Otani. Granted, the last home run of the three was hit off of a position player because the Dodgers. Oh yeah, rip to that guy. The Dodgers, got... the Dodgers absolutely mauled mauled the Marlins. The Marlins looked like a single A team matched up against the Dodgers yesterday. Um, mm. The Dodgers uh, won the game yesterday, I believe, uh, by a score of twenty to four. Twenty to four, just to show you the disparity of the caliber of the two teams. One Sounds on, about right. <laughs> one of the one of the teams is is on its way to the playoffs for the thousandth time. The other team is on their way to another 100 loss season for the thousandth time. But mm. Otani, 
I think it's safe to say he's gonna he's got the National League MVP locked up, and uh, he's gonna be the first player. Not only is he the first player to do a 50-50, he's also gonna be the first player in Major League Baseball history to probably to win back to back MVP awards in separate leagues. Obviously, winning with the Angels last season in the American League. Now he's gonna win the National League Most Valuable Player award. Uh, this year as a member of the Dodgers and he's going to be doing so as a designated hitter which is even more impressive first time that's happening obviously too so I'll just add another first to uh, a list of Otani's accolades and resume so from for me as a baseball fan I can't necessarily say I'm surprised anymore I mean Otani is just in another world you know there was an old saying that uh, a long time ago before I was even born um it's for it for Mariano Rivera actually. It's weird, um, but I'll I'll explain here. There was the manager of the Twins in 1996, Tom Kelly, was so impressed with Mariano Rivera. He said that Mer- Rivera needs to be in a higher league. He can't be here because we can't hit him. That's the way I feel basically when it comes to Shohei Otani. He needs to be in mm-hmm. a higher league because nobody can touch him here in Major League Baseball. He's heads he's head and tails above everybody else, maybe with the exception of Aaron Judge, who could be his equal, and maybe and a couple of other guys like Moogie Betts, Freddie Freeman, and so on and so forth. You know, mm-hmm. those guys are in rarefied air in a class of their own, basically. But I mean, Otani's just so ridiculous. And, you know, he it wasn't enough for him to, you know, to to get you know, one stolen base in one game and then one home run another game. No, he had to jam everything into one game and make this, put on this performance for the ages yesterday against the Marlins. And like I said, Otani is probably going to win the NL MVP this year. And at this point, what else can you say? The guy is not human, basically. He's a baseball machine. And not only that, I mean, you looked at the distance on these home runs yesterday. I mean, some of these, I'm surprised, didn't make it to the window of um, Marlins Park or whatever. Yeah. It was, it was absolutely ridiculous. And, uh, yeah, Otani is, has created the 50-50 club. And in all honesty, I don't know if um, anybody can join him anytime soon um, when it comes to um, – I mean, maybe, I guess, I guess maybe Acuna possibly – um, when he comes back, uh, I don't know if Acuna has 50 home run power, um, but um, but yeah, Otani is just ridiculous, and yeah, he just adds he 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 adds another impressive accolade to his resume, and uh, yeah, congratulations to Otani. Yeah, um, you pretty much hit the nail on the head for what this guy brings, but I might even take it another step uh, to a notch, which I don't even know if I can even do, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, yeah, Shohei Otani, congratulations. 50-50 club, first baseball player ever to do it. And going six for six with three home runs and 10 RBIs on the day that you do that just makes it even more just eye-popping. Like, you're just not going to see a stat line this often in a game of baseball, even in the old era type of days. Um, and you could say, well, it's the Marlins. Who, who cares? I mean, essentially, you're going against specifically a baseball opponent. This is a, a very special accomplishment. Um, and take into account, right, Otani was a fridge in this past offseason. He went from one of the uh, losingest franchises in, in the – I said I almost said it, Anaheim Angels – the L.A. Angels to the L.A. Dodgers, the essentially the other side of things. And um, he's absolutely killing it. And he's not even pitching. This is his first year that he's not even pitching. And Otani just decides to go, all right, I'll take it a step notch and go do a 50-50 instead. Like, who does that? Like, but, black. Yeah, I'm, I mean, just absolutely just incredible. And I, and I told you off the air and uh, a bunch of my Yankee fans, because obviously as a Red Sox fan, I do like Aaron Judge a lot. I really love his game. Uh, one of the best baseball players out there. All my respect to him. But I think in terms of when you look at the Otani judge and, and every specific guy out there, there's nobody like this guy. There, there's just nobody, at least to me, that specifically – when I went to the ballpark last year when the Red Sox played the Angels, I didn't care that they played the Angels. I was going to see this guy play in person. Um, and I the amount of crowd, Ryan, that was specifically in that Angel, like waiting for him in the Angel dugout, was something I've never seen a lot of times uh, going to a Red Sox game, this and that. And then after the game was over, I decided to, you know, most people kind of wait for the buses for your own team. 
I was waiting for the Angels bus because I was essentially, you know, the amount of crowd. I was curious to see how that would look, especially with Otani going to free agency. And it was just, it was incredible. Um, so it's not just the overall what Otani brings on the field. It's what he brings also off the field. His marketing is absolutely incredible. Um, everything about it is absolutely insane. And like I said to you off the air, um, of course, last night as well, too, is as much as it would hate for me to see the Yankees be in the World Series, but to see this guy against Aaron Judge, Yankees, Dodgers, there's nothing else better, I think, than that type of baseball. In October, where all time is going 50-50, Judge is obviously having another monster season. Um, you're just having two of the best um, overall baseball players that are going to be for the long term going at it head to head. And I think that having a World Series of those two would be absolutely peak baseball. And for the people saying that baseball is a dying sport, I think we'll definitely get back into something like that. Um, but yeah, just give all the credit. Otani, you're a machine, you're a unicorn. They don't call you that for nothing. And uh, Ryan, didn't he also like have a massive injury to start the year? And people were kind of like in April, kind of like, what's going on with him? And now just, just, think, just think about what he was. Just think about how his season began. It couldn't have started any more on rocky terms. He was he had right. a Tommy John surgery, and his translator was arrested for gambling. Yeah, yeah it's like it's not like a peak memory now. It's like, well, that like really happened. And of course, now he decides to just go on a rampage. Um, and so I wouldn't be shocked if he keeps on doing this in October. I really, it's just to see him play baseball in October, Ryan, I don't know about you. It just feels awesome. It, uh, it's, it's something. And Otani literally had to change all his Dodgers gear after achieving the records because they needed to send that to the hall of fame. So Otani, I'm sure was, had to keep going in and out of the locker room throughout the course of the game. For those of you who don't mm. know, Major League Baseball players have a lot of uh, shirts, jerseys, and, and pants in the locker rooms for occasions such as this. And um, Otani broke the Dodgers home run record that was set by Sean Green, as a matter of fact, too. Um, Otani, um, it was something that I did find on, um, on ESPN. Yes. So these were some other things that Otani broke or said, o the 10 runs batted in are the most by a Dodgers player in one game since uh, runs batted in became an official stat in 1920. And that was according oh to God. ESPN research, his 51 home runs also set the Dodgers single season home run record. Um, Otani's final line, um, for, for yesterday afternoon, like I said, six for six, two doubles, three home runs, 10 runs batted in, and two stolen bases. And um, a lot of celebrities were sending, were um, giving him his flowers mm -hmm. yesterday yep. um, after the game. Among them were Irvin Magic Johnson, Patrick Mahomes, Joel <laughs> Embiid, LeBron James, um, the Dodgers themselves. Jose freaking Canseco actually <laughs> uh, also provided some support for Shohei Otani. Uh mm. Jose Steroids Canseco, the founder of the 4040 Club, is now kicked to the curb um, thanks to uh, Shohei Otani. So the 4040 Club is utter, is now relegated to kind of one of the lesser impressive stats now in Major League yeah. Baseball, the creation of this. <laughs> um, and Billie Jean King even um, oh, chimed wow. in and uh, provided her support to uh, Shohei Otani. So mm. Otani is now the talk of baseball. And... Um, yeah, it's it's just incredible. It really is. And like I said, you think about what he interred in the off season, and we were wondering. I remember when we first started the, this uh, podcast for this season. Um, even Marlin fans, I know there weren't many of them. There were more Dodger fans at the stadium yesterday than Marlin fans were. That was probably one of the biggest crowds that that stadium has seen all year long. But because most of them were from probably from from Los Angeles, even Marlin fans mm -hmm. were giving a standing ovation and a curtain call. I mean, how could so, you not? How could you not? I think that would have happened <laughs> yeah. anywhere at that point because Otani I mean, is basically universally respected around yeah. uh, baseball, and and you know it's it's just amazing. It really is. The guy is just ridiculous. And Miguel Rojas, the Dodgers shortstop, said, "I almost cried to be honest. It was a lot of emotions because mm. of everything that happens behind the scenes that we get to witness every single day." You know, Otani is just so respected, so revered by uh, his peers that everybody really just admires what this guy's able to do because what he does, not many other people can do or have done before in the past. And Otani has just taken the sport of baseball to a whole another level. And, you know, the bar is now set higher and higher. And, you know, he just continues to answer the call. 
I mean, people were saying, you know, if Otani can't pitch this year, then, you know, is that going to rob him of his, you know, special status or something like that? He put that to, he put that to sleep and he said, OK, what can I do this season? Basically, that is so otherworldly. If I can't pitch, I got to do something so otherworldly that people will never forget. And this is what he decides to do <laughs> in the one year that he can't pitch. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't know if this would if this will happen this year necessarily. Um, but do you possibly think maybe a 60 60 season from him could be possible? With this guy, nothing else is out of the realm. I will say this. This is this is a guy of a freak of nature. Um, do I see it happening? Probably not. But he hit another homer past 50 yesterday. He's at 51. How many games do we have left? Like 12? Uh, nine. Nine? Nine. nine about, yeah, about nine games. There's three series left in the season. I mean, I, I wouldn't rule out him being at like 57, 58 when it's all said and done. I think I he's mean, going he to be close to 60. Yeah, I think you could definitely get close to 60 in terms of home runs. I think, steals. I think he can get – I think, honestly, I think he's going to get 60 steals. I think he's going to get 60 okay. um, because he's an on-base machine. Pit t- teams are very afraid to pitch to him. Actually, um, but I will give uh, Skip Schumacher a little bit of credit. I don't know if you saw a clip from him um, yesterday in the dugout. Um, I think it was during his last at bat of the game after he had gone five for five with already two home runs. And the Marlins had to bring in a position player to pitch to a time because the game was so far out of reach. And the Dodgers and the Marlins were sort of said, Why are we even bothering, you know, blowing our blowing these guys' arms out? Let's just bring mm-hmm. in a position player, preserve the bullpen. And um, you know, I think, you know, there was a question as to if Schumacher would ever walk Otani, and you can read Schumacher's lips, F that. I mean, the, oh, Marlins, wow. the Marlins are out of it. What are the Marlins playing for at this point in the season? The Marlins they're probably they're probably excited to see what he was going to do I mean, on that side. They wanted to see history. So, yeah. you know, so Schumacher said, screw that. Let's see history. And, mm. um, yeah, I mean, Otani, I definitely think that Otani has the potential to steal 60 bases this year. There's still nine games left. To me, if Otani gets on base – three times a game, I think he could add to his stolen base total like two to- two more times um, with each passing game. So I think that's – they, they have the Rockies this weekend, so, I mean <laughs> – They're they're home, right? Yeah, they're, they're in L.A. They're in L.A. So he's going to get – he get... He's going to get a hell of a standing ovation tonight. Yep. One more other thing, Ryan, too, before we, we can be able to move on to the next topic. Did you see that the fan for the 50 homer ball, the fan that dropped the ball? I saw that. I didn't know what his reaction was, but I know that that guy just probably lost a lot of money. I was going to say, yeah, because people on social media are just like, man, like rip to that fan that dropped the ball. Yeah, that's depressing. There's no worse feeling than um, losing a prize historic souvenir. I knew the guy could have had a lot on his plate if had he uh, secured that baseball. The fan who got the ball walked out of the stadium with the ball. Uh, Shohei should have gotten that ball. I hope it wasn't Zach Campbell. (laughs) Yeah, that guy's had enough. (laughs) He did that with uh, Alex Rodriguez's 3,000th hit back in 2015. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, he walked out with it. But, you know, the fan may just need a a little bit of time to decide what he wants to do with it exactly. So, um, you know, hopefully – I mean, I don't necessarily – it wasn't Zach Campbell, by the way. Um, Hopefully, um, you know, sometimes, you know, fans need just a few minutes. It can be overwhelming. You know, you catch a big souvenir baseball, and all of a sudden you got a bunch of people surrounding you, the press is around you, the security is around you. It can be a little bit much, and honestly, I'm not against fans for just taking a few days here and there to think about what exactly they want to do. And at the end of the ga- at the end of the day, you know, the game is you know about- Albert Pujols said it best. You know, a couple of years ago when he hit 700, you know, the fan who caught his baseball didn't give the ball back to him. He said that that ball's for the fans. It's just the fans, and you know, made the game basically. So you know, he mm-hmm. keep it. So you know. We'll, we'll see what, what ends up happening with it. One way or the other, Otani has done everything the Dodgers could possibly ask for from him this year in a season where he didn't even play the field. So, yeah, I guess all you can do is just bow down to the king at this point or 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 soon to be three-time MVP, three-time MVP winner. You know, I had like I said, I had Mookie Betts at the beginning of the season, but uh, I think it's safe mm. to say that Otani has uh, surpassed him in the MVP votes. And, and all honesty, I don't think it would be – it would not be a surprise to me if he wins it unanimously again. 
Is it, I, I, oh, no, definitely not. I mean, okay. I think Lindor has had a very, very good second half. And he has, overall, he's had a very good season for the Mets. I mean, without him, that Mets team is definitely not where they are today. Um, and you could say, well, you know, yeah, Otani plays with a lot better overall talent on that Dodgers team. You can't specifically after what Otani's done, 50-50 club, first guy ever, especially for him to play without pitching. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just – you just cannot, you know, go against that specific line. What's- yeah, I think I think it's safe to say that this is no longer a tight MVP race at this point, even though even though Lindor's had a great year for the Mets, and the Mets have had a great year themselves. And it looks like they're uh, going to make the postseason this year. Um, so we'll see what Two happens. Two New York teams in the playoffs, it's just like old, old times. We'll get into that later on in the episode, but we have a couple of other things that we need to discuss. We're going to stick on the Dodgers for the time being, and we're going to talk about Tyler Glass now. And, uh, you know, I sometimes joke about his last name, Glass. Glass. Unfortunately, the guy got hurt again, and he's done for the season with an elbow injury. He was diagnosed with a sprained elbow last Saturday. And uh, for, unfortunately, during his rehab, he suffered a setback. And now because of this, he got transferred to the 60-day injured list, which basically has effectively eliminated him from the postseason. Glass now has had a ton of injury problems throughout his career. He's a great pitcher, don't get me wrong, but he cannot stay on the field to save his life. It's not good at all. And it's a blow to the Dodgers rotation, certainly, going into the postseason. The Dodgers rotation is definitely their biggest question mark heading into the playoffs. I feel like it is every single season. They definitely yep. have they definitely have the bats, but when it comes to, you know, crunch time, you know, their pitching just falls apart. And not only that, I mean, Clayton Kershaw has been dealing with, I think he's been dealing with an injured toe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I think he's on his way back, but we talked off the year. Kershaw's yeah. never been a great guy in the postseason. So it's, it's I'm not saying it's a negative asset, but it's it's somebody specifically that you just cannot trust when the big lights happen. Yeah, not only that, Kershaw's 36 years old. He's not the same pitcher he was, obviously, 10 years ago. So you don't know what you're going to get out of him. You're just hoping at this point Kershaw's able to give you maybe five innings in a postseason start and limit the damage to maybe three runs at most. But um, it's a blow to the Dodgers, no doubt about it. And, you know, it's it's a little – I find it almost like karma-like in a way because I remember at the beginning of the season or earlier this year, I think Glasnow was, had an interview. I forget who – I think it was with Chris Rose, if I'm not mistaken, where Rose was talking about, you know, the amount of injuries that have been piling up with pitchers around Major League Baseball with all the UCL Tommy John surgeries and all that. Yep. He was interviewing Glasnow, trying to get his perspective on that. And he and Rose, I think, asked him, um, do you regret the training regimen that you guys have undertaken, you know, in order to get where you are today? You know, putting your body and your arm through so much physical abuse, you know, trying to throw as hard as you can. Would you change anything about this? And Glasnow flat out said, no, it's made me a better pitcher. You know, I understand that this comes with, you know, that that injuries are part of the game. You know, I understand the consequences that come with it. But. You know, I wouldn't change anything about, you know, what I've done and, you know, because I can't really learn. And if I didn't learn this way, I don't know if I would have, I don't know if I would be able to pitch in major league baseball. So <sighs> this is all he knows, but, you know, mm-hmm. now you're not going to be pitching on the biggest stage imaginable, you know, Dodger stadium in October, you know, he's going to be missing out on that. So you know, I guess what goes around comes around, unfortunately. So it's a yeah. blow to Glass now. It's a blow to the Dodgers. And, you know, like I said, this has been their biggest Achilles heel for quite some time. And it's been the probably the biggest reason why they haven't been able to go that far in the playoffs um, in recent years. I mean, their pitching last year in the playoffs was just abysmal against the Diamondbacks. It was absolutely terrible. And, I mean, obviously, I mean, the Dodgers do have Yoshinobu Yamamoto back, obviously. So they're going to be relying a lot on him. I think Yamamoto is probably going to be the game one starter for the Dodgers um, in the uh, NLDS. Because I do think the Dodgers are still going to win the National League West this year and they'll get a bye. So Yamamoto is probably going to be your ace in the postseason. Um, And, you know, I don't think Yamamoto is going to be faced. I think he's ready for this um, based on his demeanor. Um, And this is what he came over to Los Angeles to do. And, um, but yeah, uh, Tyler Glass now is done uh, for the uh, 2024 season. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if he's going to need any operation or anything like that. They're not saying it on any of these, um, news outlets like CBS Sports or, um, ESPN. Um, I think mostly he's just going to be, um, resting, I think, for the most part. There's, there, there was no uh, damage shown to his UCL, fortunately, or anything like that. So it doesn't look like he's going to need, Tommy John surgery, but I think his elbows just just had it 
at this point, and I think it just needs rest. So unfortunately, it's probably just best for uh, Glass now to just shut it down the rest of the year. So, yep, uh, Glass now is done. I don't know if you wanted to add to this or anything. Yeah, uh, no, I I think all in all, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, this is a massive blow for this team. And you also have to remember the trade that the Dodgers made for this guy. They they had a lot of no, in terms of pieces. I know obviously the pieces that they kind of moved on from were obviously household type of guys, but uh, you know they put a lot of stock into this guy to um, hopefully stay out, out there on the field. And um, you know we've seen in his past you know history that the, this guy just cannot stay on the field, and it, and it sucks because he is uh, one of the best pitchers out there. Um, his stuff is very, very good when it's on. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, just it's all it's all up here with him. He, he just it always tends to be like the same type of injuries with him, also, um, which is definitely something like down the road. Is if you're going to deal with a lot of D's, it's going to be hard for you to kind of get yourself kind of back to where you might have been in the past um, because it's a ton of arc uh, torque and it's a ton of like motion terms on your body. So. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a massive blow for that team. Um, you know, the Dodgers, they were hopeful to, you know, bring some pieces in this offseason to kind of alleviate the um, the pain from last year in the playoffs where their pitching just was not good enough. Um, they were hopeful for that. You know, they, they brought some young guys in to hopefully take the next step, including a guy like Bobby Miller. Um, you could have think thought maybe he could maybe kind of come in and, and, you know, do, you know, uh, take his spot, but he's been awful. They actually optioned him down um, to the minors, which is crazy because his stuff in the last couple of years was very, very good. So, um, yeah, it just – it sucks. Um, you just hate injuries. I mean, I feel like a broken record run for the whole entire season. We've been talking injuries on these people. So, um, yeah, it just it, – it sucks. It sucks for that team. It sucks for the game because uh, when he's pitching, he's been a really good pitcher. Yeah, I mean, and also don't forget, he signed a five-year, $135 million extension with the Dodgers uh, in the <laughs> offseason. So you just hope that this yeah, doesn't – I don't know about that. You just, you just hope this doesn't become a recurring theme for him um, in, the, in the following years and of this contract. And I know for a fact that Dodger fans are not too pleased about this at all. Um, I mean, Dodger fans are very loyal, and um, they I'm sure they're not happy about this. So, yeah. We'll I just, don't blame them. Yep, we'll just see where this goes from here. But Glass now done for the year. He will not be joining the Dodgers for the postseason. Well, I'm sure he'll be in the dugout supporting the team, but he will not. Be, <laughs> but he will not be taking the mound um, during yep. the playoffs. So um, we'll stick a little bit with the Dodgers, but we're also going to go around the league and talk about some other teams that have qualified for the uh, 2024 postseason. So right now, four teams have punched their ticket to the postseason this year. The, Bre the Milwaukee Brewers were the first team to do so. They clinched it on Wednesday. They also clinched the National League Central Division in the process, so they were the first team to punch their ticket. My Yankees will be back in the playoffs this year. I'm very happy about that. They defeated the Mariners on Wednesday evening. And very uh, sarcastic little clap from uh, Ben on the left right there. Um, so the Yankees after No, I, I'm saying this all due to respect, right? I'm happy for you. That's all I ask. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm taking this with a grain of salt right now because, you know, this team has a tendency to kill me in the postseason. And they've done that in recent years. So we'll see what happens this year. I'm happy, but – I'm not getting cocky. That's the worst thing I think that could po you could possibly be when you go into the playoffs. Mm. Do not be cocky and do not be trash talk when you haven't won anything yet. Well, so. ju Judge said something really cool, too, um, during the champagne um, shower. Uh, Meredith Morakovich, for those who don't know, she's a Yan yes reporter from the Yankees. I'm um, asking Judge like, how I feel about it. He basically said, well, it feels good to be back out there missing it um, last year, but the job's not done. And that's essentially that's what a leader should be saying. Um, you know, this is not – you guys haven't even gone the division yet, which I think for him that's kind of the next thing. I think you guys will, but we could talk about that in a little bit as well. But, uh, yeah, just give a respect for respect to – you know, I'm really happy for you, man. Yeah, so it's the uh, Brewers, the Yankees, the Guardians um, clinched their spot in the playoffs. This is the first appearance for them in the playoffs since 2022, same as the Yankees they missed last year. Steven Vogt, you know – what a job he's done as manager of uh, the Guardians. And um, yep. for a first-year manager, for a guy that retired from playing just two years ago, you know, gets this gig and he already leads Cleveland to um, their – to the pull up to the postseason most likely they'll win the central i think um you know the guardians have um, started to write the ship 
and they've been playing some really good baseball recently. I think you can say that Stephen Vogt, I think, is probably the favorite to win AL Manager of the Year this year, um, if I had to if I had to guess. I mean, he's done a very good job. And, um, of course, finally the Dodgers um, after yesterday's crushing victory of the Marlins are back in the postseason for the thousandth time. Um, I believe, why not? I think this is their 12th straight postseason appearance, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 12th or 13th. Um, dating back to um, 2013. Um, mm. Yes, they're 11th in 12 years. And, um, well, That's you know, like nuts. you mentioned, this will be Shohei Otani's first postseason appearance. People have been clamoring for this for years, and it's finally happening. Shohei Otani will be playing meaningful baseball in October. Not in an Angels uniform, unfortunately, for Angel fans, but in Dodger <laughs> blue, which I'm sure is a tough There is a god. <laughs> which I'm sure is a tough pill to swallow uh, for Angel yep. fans. There are no Angels for Angel fans, unfortunately, um, when it comes oh, to Shohei Otani. So, um, Otani making his postseason debut this year. I think he's going to rig. I think he's going to go. Oh, yeah. I expect him to embrace this. And I think having the bat of Otani in that lineup is going to be enormous for the Dodgers. I mean, I think the Dodgers won 100 games last year, and they did make the playoffs. And like we mentioned, they were just completely embarrassed by the Diamondbacks, who obviously went on to go to the World Series last year. But I think adding the bat of Otani was a big, crucial missing component of that Dodger lineup. Now they filled that, they filled that yeah. void with him now this year. And you just add what Otani has done this year into that lineup. That Dodger lineup is going to be hell to work through for any postseason yeah. for this year. Especially when it's on, too, which it is right now. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, when it comes to the Dodgers in the playoffs, it really is just going to come down to their pitching. I think the hitting will, yep. will do I think the hitting will do its part for the most part. It really just comes mm -hmm. down to their rotation. Is how's their rotation going to perform? I trust Yamamoto. I think he's going to do uh, I think he's going to do good yep. for the most part. But um, other than Yamamoto, I mean, who else can you really trust in that rotation? I mean, that's where really where the big question mark lies with yeah. me when it comes to the Dodgers, at least. So um, the Dodgers, obviously, no surprise there. They were destined for the postseason from the get go um, in the off season. Um, the Yankees, obviously, you know, like we mentioned with them, they also mi they missed the playoffs last year. They had a terrible year last year. One of the worst Yankee team of my lifetime was last year, which is saying something. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, they're only possibly their only year with uh, Juan Soto. Um, Juan mm -hmm. Soto will be playing in October with the Yankees. Soto did have an injury scare yesterday, though, in the final game of the Yankees game against the Mariners. Mm -hmm. He made, an, he made yeah. an amazing sliding catch down the right field foul line, but he um, crashed his knee into the wall, unfortunately. He was down for a few mm -hmm. minutes. Soto's put his body through so much this year, fouling balls. Right. I was going to ask you something really quick while we're essentially with the Yankee standpoint. If the Yankees clinch the division, right? And yes. I think, like I said, I think that we pretty much will talk about in terms of the – you guys have the Orioles next week. Obviously, a lot of massive series next week. But if you guys clinch the division, do you guys personally start to rest some guys kind of just before the postseason? Or will you kind of keep some of these guys still out there to kind of keep them, you know, um, you know, getting the work in and stuff? Because you just – you don't want to risk anything before the big games. I think you keep running them out there. I think they should keep running them out there because you, you still want to get the number one seed overall in the American League, and you want home field advantage That's throughout true. the whole postseason. And, you know, also, I mean, if you get one of those first two seeds, you also get a bye, and you're not going to play for about four or five days. So you want to try and keep these guys, you know, as active as possible. I mean, we've seen how some teams have struggled with the layoff. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, the Yankees had the layoff two years ago and they were able to beat Cleveland in the division series barely by the skin of their teeth, but they were able to, to do that. But yeah, I, I definitely think they should still keep playing these guys if they clinch the division with a few games left to go in the season. And, you know, that's the way it should be. I mean, if you want to give them the next day off, just give most of these, if you want to give most of your regulars, you know, one yeah. day off, that's fine. That's, that's completely fine. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can also give them – I mean, if you want to give them the last day of the season off or something like that, that's fine too. You know, most teams do that regardless. So, um, mm -hmm. or you like don't have to – Preseason game football. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't even have to play them the full game either. You can let you can run them out there yeah. for four to five innings for a little bit and then, um, you know, give your bench warmer some playing time because they're not going to see the field when it comes time for the postseason to begin with. So, so yeah, um, 
it was a it was an injury scare for Soto yesterday. He crashed his knee into the wall, and like I said, he's put his body through a lot this year. But he plays hard, and uh, that's what you want out of him. Um, he's gonna just get precautionary X-rays on him. I even whenever uh, any player gets X-rays, I just like tense up regardless. I mean, Soto sounded fine. He sounded optimistic. He said it wasn't serious, but they just want. But the Yankees, you know, they don't want to mess around. Obviously, with uh, one of their star players, they just want to make sure he's yeah. okay. Um, I feel like the Guardians are playing with house money, um, you know, with a rookie manager. I think they could make. I think they can be a dangerous team when it comes time for the playoffs. I mean, mm-hmm. Jose Ramirez, you know, has been the longest tenured player there. He's been in baseball. He's been in the league for almost ten years now. You know, super overrated man. You know, Cleveland um, wants to get him a World Championship. Cleveland obviously has the longest World Series drought, um, 75, 76 years. Um, they haven't won yep. since 1848, back when they were That's the Indians. Wild. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's been a long time coming for Cleveland. Uh, you know for a fact that they are looking to end this drought once and for all. And uh, we'll see what they do. Their pitching, you know, is is up and down. Their rotation is up and down for the most part. Their bullpen, though, is deadly. And Emmanuel Class A has just had an amazing year. He basically has had a Mariano Rivera-like season. He's just been phenomenal that that lineup's also very solid that team thrives with runners in scoring position which is something a lot of teams struggle to do when it comes time yep. for the playoffs you know cleveland really knows how to put the bat on the ball and they do manufacture runs they're a small ball team um in a way too you know they'll bunt for hits if they have to you know they they just care about you know making things happen and they do that they're pesky they're very mm-hmm. pesky and the brewers you know they um you know, Pat Murphy, a veteran coach, finally becoming manager for them this season. You know, you know, the Brewers obviously lost Craig Council in the offseason. You know, he betrayed them and went to the rival Cubs. And uh, this mm-hmm. is a little uh, poetic justice, I'd say, for Brewer fans. You know, yep. Council's not going to the playoffs this year in all likelihood. The Brewers are. The Brewers have been around forever, too, and they've never won the World Series. They've only been to the World Series once in 1982 when they were in the American League. So, you know. Wow. The- so, you know, the Brewers – and the Brewers have had some really good seasons over the past 10 years. They've been to mm-hmm. the playoffs a couple of times here and there, but they've never been back to the World Series since 82. So they've got a lot to prove. Mm-hmm. So that you know for a fact – They also lost Corbin Burns too. We, we yeah. also kind of – when we talked about them at the beginning of the season, we were just like maybe they take a step back. You know, they, they lost their ace. They lost their manager. Nope. They they essentially – I think for the most part, didn't get the beat. So no, it's pretty I impressive. Mean, and also, I mean, you talk what what a season from guys like Willie Adamas, Jackson, Churio. Those guys have just blossomed this year. Churio's become a stud, and he's only 20 years old. Pretty funny um, moment um, on social media. I don't know if you saw. They put they the Brewer players put non-alcoholic beer around Churio's um, around Churio's. <laughs> I think, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, Churio's I not because Churio's not 21 yet, but. Um, mm. For a 20-year-old, he looks like he fits right in um, with the uh, with the Brewers clubhouse, and the Brewers would not have been where they are without him. And the Brewers, I think, I think this is one of the better Brewer teams in recent years. I think this is the best Brewer team since 2018 when they took the Dodgers to seven games in the National League Championship Series. I think this is one of their better chances to make some noise in the postseason this year. I mean, obviously, not being not having Christian Yelich hurts, but um, I still think the Brewers are a dangerous team, regardless. In spite of that. So watch out for Milwaukee, and you know for a fact that they're definitely playing with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. There are a lot of teams that got a lot of things to prove in the postseason yep. this year. A lot of teams um, have something to prove. And um, so those four teams are in, and there are a couple of other teams who are fighting to get in. One of those teams are the Detroit Tigers, and the Tigers are making a charge for the postseason, and they right now are currently tied for the final wild card spot. And the Tigers are just red hot right now. They've won four in a row. They're eight and two in their last ten. They're right now at eighty and seventy three. They just swept the Royals in Kansas City. Oh my goodness, Tigers, man! <laughs> they, they they are they're a threat. Don't take them lightly. They are they can they can play ball. And what a step forward it's been for them. You know, we knew that the Tigers were on the rise. You know, they had a lot of young. T- good solid foundation they that they've been building up there for several years now and it looks like this you know foundation is a little ahead of schedule i mean people had mostly either you know the guardians or the twins you know winning the central 
you know, rightfully so. I mean, those teams were, you know, obviously based on what they've done over the past couple of years, the favorites coming into this season. People were kind of high on the Royals, obviously, with the moves that they had made this year. And the Royals have had a very good year, too. But not many people were thinking about the Tigers. Um, and the Tigers, you know, have just had a very good year. And this, they've been playing the best baseball, you know, you can imagine. I think they've been the hottest team in baseball for the past month, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think anybody's had a better record than them. And it really mm-hmm. started in that Little League Classic against the Yankees when they came back and walked it off. That was really kind mm-hmm. of a turning point for them. They've kind of just built off of that. And they've just gotten – they've just had a very, very good year. I mean, you look at that um, – I mean, Tariq Skubal, obviously going to probably win the American Cy Young Award mm-hmm. this year. He's just been phenomenal. He's had a great year. That, pit, that Tiger rotation, you know, has gotten better as the year has gone on. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, Spencer Torkelson is a very good player. Um, Austin – Riley Austin, Green. Riley Green is good. Is it Austin Meadows? Is he on the – or um, – No, Parker Meadows. Parker Meadows. They, they essentially, essentially look each, like each other and they swim like each other. I always, like get, both hitter. I always get them – I always get them confused. But, yeah, Torkelson and Riley Green really set the tone for that Tiger offense. And Matt Beerling's been really Matt underrated. Very good as well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, the Tigers have just been playing great baseball. Um, based on what you've seen, I know that, you know, none of us, neither of us are Tiger fans, obviously, but do you think that the <laughs> Tigers um, are going to secure a spot for the playoffs? Well, yeah, it's crazy because obviously, you know, we were talking about your team already clinching in. Um, if it wasn't for this team, Ryan, uh, you know, that at least give me a little glimmer of hope to uh, see how the Red Sox can finish the rest of the year because we are one of the teams, technically speaking, uh, that is still kind of in the mix for that third wild card. Um, it's between the Twins, the Tigers, the Mariners, who you guys just played, funny enough, and the Red Sox. Um, the Red Sox, I think, are four, four and a half back after losing two out of three to the Rays where we could not hit a leg. Um, back. I think they're elimination four- so their elimination number, I guess, would be five or something like that. I think it was six yesterday, yes. so probably five. But we essentially, Alex Cora was getting asked about yesterday after the game, like, you know, how how we feel about, you know, the rest of the season. He's just like, well, he said that he feels like the team's been eliminated like 15 times throughout the year. Yeah. Um, so um, it's like, fuck it, why not at this point? Um, we have the Twins this weekend. The Twins are currently, I think, right now outside looking in. They've been really falling down falling down and we're talking about the Tigers right now, they can get in. I I, I would when I'll put it past them. Um, you know, they have a massive series. You know, they could do a lot of wonders for your team, Ryan, this weekend as they have the Orioles this weekend. Yeah. Um that Tigers um uh, fan base must be going crazy. Um, you know, they're gonna have a lot of course to look forward to. Um, you know, so so that should be really exciting. I oh, know I'm sorry, that's gonna be in Baltimore. They just played. They, they they just played the Orioles there. Um, the heck, they might be bringing their fan base to Baltimore too, because a lot of away fans come to Baltimore. Crazy enough, so I want to put it past them. But yeah, they, they've had a very um, good end to this season, and for a lot of these teams, you look at a team. They kind of remind me, right, of the Diamondbacks of last year. A team that I think just didn't have a lot of expectations. They kind of just rode in really, really hot, and. Um, you know, we've kind of seen that, you know, you know, Don Maxers did it last year. They went into the World Series of Wild Card team. You know, it's not like division winners obviously are great, but it doesn't mean I'm not saying it doesn't mean anything, but it doesn't have the same type of impact as it once was before. It's essentially once you get in, especially with a lot of these type of teams that are just there's not really that one team that stands out kind of on top of the other. The Tigers can make damage. I'm not saying they're going to go forward deep or anything, but as we've seen in the past, of course, like last year with the Diamondbacks, you know, anything's possible. So, um, yeah, I think they could definitely get in. You know, the, the Mariners did not look great against you guys. They had a lot of boneheaded mistakes. I still don't trust their offense uh, and, and the Red Sox specifically, even though if they sweep the Twins, it's just a very hard uphill to climb at this point for us, sadly. So, yeah, I think the Tigers are going to get in. Yeah, I could see it too. I mean, right now, you know, the Tigers and the Twins are – Lock, are dead locked in a tie for that final wild card spot. And, um, you know, like I said, the Tigers are, are coming off of a sweep of the Royals in Kansas City. You know, I yeah, watched, I did watch a little bit of that final game between the two teams. Tigers look good, man. They really are – they really look like a legitimate threat. Not to mention A.J. Hinch is an experienced manager, and he led the Astros to, to the World Series two times before and won one of those times. I don't care about the whole science stealing or scandal or whatever mm-hmm. that is. Hinch is a good manager. Yeah, I don't, I don't he know. is. 
you know, say what you want about him. He know he knows how to manage. And um, I think that team has really just gelled together. And it's it, it really is another amazing turnaround. You know, last year, you know, the Orioles obviously returned to the playoffs just a few years removed from a 115 loss season. Don't forget, it was only five years ago this Tigers team lost 114 games. And now look where mm-hmm. they are. Right back in the playoff hunt. I mean, the Tigers haven't made the playoffs since 2014. Um, coincidentally, they uh, were swept by the Orioles in that series, and they are playing the Orioles this weekend. And this mm-hmm. series is just really big for both teams, obviously. You Massive. Know, it's huge. I mean, the Orioles have a pretty comfortable lead in the um, in the wild card. I think wild I mean, card. Mm-hmm. the Orioles yeah. the Orioles are going to make the playoffs. No, in my regard. Yeah. They're, they're Oriole gonna- fans on Twitter, Ryan, are losing their mind. They're talking like they're like the worst team out there. And I'm like, do you guys realize specifically that you guys are still a young team with a lot of young pieces? And, you know, I, I still want a bit of pass up for them not to go on a run either. They have pieces. Yes. They're really just nothing. No, yeah, they just have not played well though for a long time, and you know they they just haven't dominated like they did last year. You know, everyone's kind of had like a little bit of a sophomore slump in a way. Um, it happens. It happens, but um, I mean the Orioles will still make the playoffs. Um, you know, they don't have to worry about that. If um, but yeah, I mean it really comes down to that second and third wild card spot. The 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 Royals have the second wild card spot. They have a two game lead there. So you know it's really just between it. Really, it's going to be. Um, the other two wild card spots are going to be occupied by central teams. I mean, the yeah. playoffs this year are going to be in the American League. They're going to. We know the Yanks and the Guards are already in. The Astros, we know, are going to win the uh, West eventually because, of course, what a collapse mm. by the Mariners <laughs> again. Um, and the other, and then you got the Orioles who are going to be in there. But yeah, the other two teams are either going to be. It's either going to be. It's going to come down to the Royals, the Tigers, and the Twins. Those three teams are going to be fighting for those final two spots in the playoffs this year. And, really, yeah. and I just – I do not trust the Twins. I just think that they're a very overrated team. Um, you know, they just – their offense is up and down and their pitching's up and down. There's almost – there's not enough consistency there for me to like. And I think that with the Tigers, for a team that really came in with very low expectations, you know, that can really be beneficiary or beneficial – and, you know, you just play a lot looser and you play cleaner baseball. You're like, no one expected us to be here. Let's just go out and have fun. And that's really kind yeah. of a that, – that really helps out teams more than people realize, I think. So. Yeah, and that's, I'm just taking a look at the schedules, Ron, for these teams. Um, like the Twins, they had after us for three at Fenway. I mean, this is obviously – I mean, we're essentially out. But technically, for any hope of our season, we got to sweep, which I don't think is going to happen, but we'll see. Um, the Twins have the Marlins after, which if they can't take care of the Marlins, I mean, they don't deserve to be in. And then they have the Orioles. Um, the Tigers, they have the Orioles, then they have the Rays, and then they have the White Sox. They um, currently have a very, very favorable last couple of opponents. Um, and then I think the – I mean, I, I guess the Royals probably are going to be a playoff team. I mean, I – it would be really hard for them not to, but they have the Giants this weekend and the Nationals and then the Braves. So, I mean, it's it's going to be crazy because a lot of these teams are still fighting, um, even like the Mariners, I guess, too, but I don't trust them. Um, you know, there's a lot of teams that are essentially they're going to be kind of neck and neck, and this is why we love the game. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be exciting, and this is going to be a crazy week, crazy final week. We got three more series left this year, and um, it's going to be uh, interesting to see who stays and who goes uh, when it comes time for the playoffs and uh, we'll see how it plays out. But yep, it's a very, very tight wild card race in the American league and uh, in the American league central too. I mean, the Roy- I mean the guardians, I think at this point have pulled away in the central and they're going to lock up the division within the next couple of days. So we'll see how it plays out, but um, yep. The tigers and the Royals and the twins. Keep an eye out on those three teams as we get into the final week of the season. And um, I remember at the beginning of the season, we're going to move on to our next topic. I remember at the beginning of the season when John Sterling announced his retirement um, kind of out of the blue. And, you know, we were talking about that. And um, you did bring up uh, Joey Castiglione about about him possibly retiring relatively soon. Well, it was sooner than I think um, you would have liked. Um, Castiglione announced um, during during last weekend between the Yankees Red Sox series um, at Yankee Stadium, if I'm not mistaken, that he will be um, retiring from calling Red Sox games 
after this season. Meanwhile, John Sterling is going to be coming out of retirement for a couple of days to brought, to call some Yankee postseason games, which I am very happy about. But at the same time, I'm also thinking to myself, dude, why? Like, you don't have to do this. I won't complain because I love Sterling and I love hearing his voice. But, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit ambivalent on that too because I because I also – I'm not crazy when people come out of retirement to begin with. Um, but mm-hmm. that's a pet peeve of mine. I, but, you know, this is a little more about Castiglione. I'll let you have the floor and you can just talk about Castiglione for a little bit. Yeah, um, this this obviously, if there's going to be an end to our season, that I mean, obviously, I think more likely than not, we won't be getting in for. Um, you know, I think this could be definitely finished up on a high note because this guy specifically, um, like you with with um, your childhood with with uh, John Sterling, uh, Joe Casiglione is um, is a is a figure, uh, and not only in, in the Red Sox but in Boston sports. Um, you know, he, he's actually from Connecticut, which, which where I'm, which obviously where I live in Hamden. Um, you know, his, his, uh, son Duke is a anchor on, um, WCBB. I'm still pretty sure from, from Boston. Um, and he was the, um, broadcaster for the Red Sox for 42 years, um, which is just something you just never see. Um, you know, in this game, but, but he did it for the love and he did it for the, the city, um, you know, obviously some of the greatest calls, um, whether it was obviously the 0-4 comeback against the Yankees, um, you know, the Keith Folk, um, comebacker to Folk, you know, the Red Sox have done it. Um, can you believe it? That's obviously was one of his well-known um, sayings. Um, obviously, 0-7. 13. Uh, my probably my favorite call was the um, David Ortiz Grand Slam against the Tigers. I mean, that's definitely up there. That's just obviously one of the uh, best overall Red Sox games I might have ever had, especially with the same night, uh, the same day actually, where um, the Patriots came back and came back um, against the Saints on our minute left. So it's just one of the best Boston sports moments I've ever will have and will ever witness. Um, but uh, yeah, just me having to see him, um, you know, finish off on a really high note, I think is great. Um, and uh, he he was somebody, you know, I went to a summer cottage in Maine for many years, and we didn't have cable. Um, so essentially, for me specifically during the summertime, to keep in tune for the Red Sox games, this is who we listen to. Um, and uh, you know, I would always be outside, you know, you know, having fun, you know, with my family and. We just listened to Red Sox games and he would be, he'd be somebody that, you know, the voice just stood out to me, just like, it was incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the Red Sox fans will go out, you know, and, and uh, really celebrate a great accomplishment for him. Um, the last game of the season when they play the Rays, um, you know, if I had a chance to go, I would love to go, but of course they can't make it. But for everybody that can go, um, you know, cheer loudly even if we're going to be out of the playoffs, because um, this is just somebody that, uh, you know, I think is just not only for the Red Sox, but for, but for baseball. He is just an iconic legend um, for this game. And, uh, you know, I know that he'll come back and, uh, you know, just celebrate a lot of great memories with this organization and, uh, you know, just wish him well, uh, wish him really, really well. And, uh, you know, just can't wait to see what's going on next for him. Yeah. Um, Castiglione had a legendary career. Um broadcasting our Red Sox games. I wasn't too familiar with him, obviously, because I'm not from the area, and I grew up as a Yankees fan, so I didn't really hear too many calls from him. But I know that he means a lot to Red Sox fans and to uh, New England. Um, his voice is synonymous with the Red Sox, and, um, you, know, you know, in the same way that Sterling's voice is synonymous with the Yankees. So you have Another thing, too, a fun fact, Ryan, sorry to cut you off, because I just saw this, and I really wanted to say it. He shares the same birthday as me. So it makes it even more special that I'm, yeah. as a Red Sox fan, you say the same birthday. I'm definitely going to hell that for sure. Sorry to cut you off, but I wanted to. No problem. It's pretty. It's a cool person to share a birthday with. So uh, yeah, Castiglione is going to be retiring after how many seasons has he been calling Red Sox games for? Um, forty. I think it's over forty. If I'm not mistaken. It was a. Uh, it was for a long time. Um, Joey Castiglione. Forty-two years. Forty-two years. 
So, yeah, I mean, he's been here. That would make him um, be there since 1984, if I'm not mistaken, or 83. 83, I think, 1983. Um, that yeah. was his first year as a Red Sox uh, commentator. Yep, 1983 through 2024. So uh, congratulations to Joey Castiglione on a uh, great legendary mm. career. And he got to see the, the lowest of the lows from Bill Buckner to uh, the highest of the highs with David Ortiz. So um, mm -hmm. even though that was not Bill Buckner's fault that the Red Sox lost the 86 World Series, I just want to preface that right here. It was not his fault. Yeah. But I know mm -hmm. that's but I know that unfortunately and unfairly he became the symbol of that uh of that defeat. Um but, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um and John Sterling, like I mentioned, is gonna be unretiring for the playoffs for a couple of games. Um obviously I'm not gonna complain about this. Um, but you know, at the same time, like I always feel like there's a little bit of hurting a legacy in a way when somebody comes out of retirement you get, because, you know, after after a long time, you know, after a, a long legendary career, I feel like you want to go out on a high note. Although I guess, you know, calling a Yankee championship would be a high note too. If so, they, so that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and uh, I, I feel I keep feeling bad for cutting you off, but like sometimes like my mom, you're talking mm. that he's coming back. I know you were mentioning that you know, on retiring stuff, you know, kind of can de decimate a legacy, but he, he didn't come back during the regular season. He kind yeah. of just waited out, kind of just let the Yankees kind of do his thing. I think it's kind of, it's kind of cool. Like he can kind of be back of the overall organization and, and this somehow be one of the best, one of the better uh, teams that wins it all. You can kind of look back and be like, well, he, he retired early on and he kind of just wrote out the season he was still kind of being a part of it, but then he came back for like the best part of it and uh, he showed something. So just keep in mind, Ryan, that, that, that this season for you guys can be very special and, you know, for him to come back and, and really do some big time games, maybe down the stretch, it could be really cool. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, turn on the radio broadcast and just mute the TV um, and do it that way and listen to the game that way. That'll, uh, that'll definitely uh, bring a smile to my face. And hopefully that happens. Hopefully the Yankees get 28th this year and Sterling's on the mic for it. And if that happens, I think that's the perfect way to go out. So uh, that would be definitely uh, something special. And uh, we're almost out of time here, but we do have one more topic that we do want to quickly get to. And Major League Baseball has made another deal um, with uh, Strauss, which is a German working company. So this year in the postseason, you're going to see the Strauss logo on the helmets of Major League Baseball players. Um, this is going to be the case now for the next three years in Major League Baseball. So this is going to be going through 2026. Um, and also the Strauss logo will be on um, all Major League Baseball, minor minor League Baseball helmets as well. Um, mm. 2025. Um, Strauss CEO, Henning Strauss. Um, said, baseball is such an iconic sport with all Americas. It has such a long tradition, just like our company. We're a third-generation family business, and baseball is very much a family experience. Families attending games, following their teams. Everyone is really familiar with baseball and has played baseball in their family. So it's really about that connection. Okay, so as a business standpoint, good for Major League Baseball. I'm sure this is a nice big payday for them. I'm sure they are going to be bringing in a lot of revenue and a lot of money here with this deal. Now you're going to hear it from me from a fan. This sucks. I hate this. <laughs> I don't like it at all. Enough. Just another uh, hiccup. Remember, of course, we talked about how the innings might go to five innings throughout the year. Why does baseball keep hating us, Ryan? I, I don't. It's bad enough we got to see the star insurance patch on Yankee jerseys. Now I got to see them wear a Strauss. Uh, now I got to see a Strauss logo on their helmets. How about oh, you put it? How about, why don't you just cover the Yankee logo? Why don't you just put it in front, <laughs> in front of the Yankee logo? Come on. Why don't you just cover the Yankee logo in general? I got to see a Nike swoosh. I got to see a star patch. And now I got to see a Strauss logo. <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. I'm sick of this crap. I'm absolutely sick of mm. this. So annoying. Just so freaking obnoxious. And, and and the crazy thing is, like, it's not even needed either. Like, no. like legitimately, they're just they're putting just random stuff out to, like, make money. But it's, like, for the postseason, it's just, like, you, you have to have a representation like, all I see specifically is the helmet with the logo, and that should be it. There shouldn't be any extra shit, this and that. I mean, I obviously understand that, like, this is money grabs and this and that, but it's just, like, doesn't it also kind of look bad, too? Like, just kind of the overall visual. It's not even it's just, like, they're bringing it in, but it's just, like, it doesn't even look good. No, it doesn't. I mean, Major League Baseball has had advertisements on helmets before, but those were reserved more for international for games that are played abroad overseas, like in Japan or whatever. That that's fine. I don't I don't really care about that because it's only for a short period of time. 
but the postseason is just it's a special time and you just want that you know you want all of the aesthetics you know around you know the buntings draped on the stadium and all that stuff it's supposed to just be a unique feeling and then you got to look at this ridiculous sponsorship that's on the helmets of all these people that nobody really knows about and i don't know how many people have heard heard about strauss before this deal was even made in the first place and I mean, all these sponsors on the jerseys, it feels like, you know, the NHL having sponsors all over the rink during their game, but there's, yeah. sponsors, but there's sponsors all over billboards, all over, all over the stadium to begin with. Heck, I mean, even on the pitcher's mound, um, you, you know, they typically change the sponsor on the, on the mound. Um, you know, they'll show like a car logo or something like that, you know, with, uh, after every batter or something like that. I mean, just. As long as you think we have enough sponsors, enough advertisements to begin with, why do we need to add more? I know this all, this all comes down to money. I get it. Major League Baseball mm-hmm. is a business. They want to make as much money as possible. doesn't mean I have to like it. I hate mm-hmm. this. I absolutely hate this, and I'm sick of this crap. So that that's my – I that's totally cool. agree with you on this. Like like I mentioned, it, it shouldn't be needed. It's all money grab, and, you know, just – it sucks. At least you don't have to worry about that as a Red Sox fan. That's the only positive you can take away. The Red Sox not making the postseason this year. You ain't wrong about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, you ain't wrong about. It. So yeah, Major League Baseball is incorporating the Strauss logo for the postseason. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to see this um, on Yankee helmets uh, in the postseason this year. It might make me sick, but it is what it is. Um, hopefully, a championship will make up for this, and I won't have to ever, and I won't have to um, think about it too much. But that's our show for this week. Um, next week is the final week of the regular season. And uh, by next week, I think we're going to find out who all the teams in the postseason are going to be. And we'll also provide some of our predictions as to, you know, who we think will win some postseason series and maybe even predict um, our World Series winners as well. So should be an exciting sure. episode for next week. And, uh, yeah, on behalf of Ben Cruz, I'm Ryan Tui. We'll see you then.